Well, Confucius once said, signs and symbols rule the world, not words or laws, and there's a reason for that. Because a symbol, like everything else, is just an information field carrying the information that it represents. Going to go, give you a number of examples as we go along here about this. And so, a symbol, we see it as a symbol, yeah, but that's, the hologram, that's in the hologram. It's actually a vibrating information field which enters the eyes. But it enters the eyes without fanfare. I can be looking at a symbol, I might not even know I'm looking at a symbol. I might be subconsciously looking at a symbol because it's just in my eye line and I'm not aware of it. But I'm taking in on a subconscious level that information field. But I don't know I am. Whereas, when you're getting um, communication to the ear, it's still a vibrating um, information field, what we call sound, but if it's within the uh, audio range of the ear, you know you're receiving it, unless it's uh, below threshold, subliminal. So the greatest way of getting information into the mind, into the brain, into the subconscious to influence perception is through the eyes because you don't take it in. It's almost entirely subconscious. Look at that figure right at the start of the day. 11 million sensations a second, and it the brain takes 40. But the subconscious takes the freaking lot. That's the point. And so, symbols, the information in symbols, um, is a gateway to the subconscious mind, which eventually filters through to the conscious mind and starts to influence actions. And when you focus on a symbol, you are, through entrainment, um, syncing your energetic field with what the symbol represents. Doesn't matter if you have a, uh, a misguided idea of what you think it represents, what it actually represents dictates the frequency and therefore when you sync with it, there will be an energetic connection through the symbol to that which it represents because the frequencies are the same. So when you're focused on that, that's taking you into a certain low vibrational frequency. I mean, what is, like I said, a symbol of a religion. Energy flows where attention goes. So if you can get people involved in rituals or anything that involves symbols and you put their attention on it, you are connecting them energetically, frequency-wise, uh, to that, what that represents. And, you know, sportsmen will say that when, when there's a big crowd and they're all on their side willing them to win, they get energy from them. Why? Because the focus of the crowd on who they want to win makes an energetic connection with the person and they start to feed more energy from the crowd. But it goes the other way too. When massive crowds focus on the symbols of this archontic force, whether it's personification or literal symbols, they're making the energetic connection and their energy can be trawled because there is a frequency connection. And when you have these massive, massive rituals with unbelievable numbers of people, they're trawling energy. Go to a football match and, and, and it, with a massively uh, powerful atmosphere and the, the, the hairs at the back of your neck stand up. Why? Because of the electromagnetic field generated by the crowd. That electromagnetic field en masse is what these people trawl. When you go to like Mecca and they're focusing on this, and we'll come to what that is shortly, um, what that represents is creating a frequency connection through what that represents to what that actually is. <clears throat> when they focus on Mecca, they're focusing on that car bar cube and there are consequences energetically for that. When you have a satanic stage show, and the crowd, the kids are focused on it. What it's doing is locking them into that frequency. Entrainment. So there's so many ways that we are fed off in that way. And symbols is a massive way. Of course, the eye is a universal symbol of, of this uh, network. There you see the eye on the necklace of the mysteries. It goes way, way back. Um, in a, a, banking and uh, politics, in church, in state, you see it. Um, this is thousands of years old, um, found in Ecuador. And there 
is the eye and the 13 levels of the pyramid. And under ultraviolet light, that even shines the illuminated eye. And that's what you find on the dollar bill. It's one of the major symbols of this Orcontic network. And there's 13 levels, exactly as in um, Ecuador thousands of years ago. There it is in Freemasonry. Because you'll find it in Satanism, you'll find it in Freemasonry, you'll find it in banking, you'll find it in politics, because they all ultimately are uh, worshipping the same uh, gods. That's MI5. There it is again, the security agencies. Um, MI6, uh, again, the pyramidal shape. This is a church. I think it's in Poland. And there, here we go, old twerper's back. There you go, have a twerp. Um, stage show, there it is, classic. And these are locking people in. There's Madonna. What's the chances of this? Um, Katy Perry, uh, Angelina Jolie, uh, Lady Gaga, CBS, uh, Jay-Z. Unbelievable. What's the chances of Chancellor Myrtle doing that every time? That's bloody ludicrous. It's not even a natural thing to do. And then you look, I mean, this is unbelievable, this animated bloody cartoons and, 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 and stuff. This pyramid and all-seeing eyes fricking everywhere. I'm not going to you know, go through them all because uh, you know, of time, but every one of the shots that you're going to see has got that in it. Look at them, all over the bloody place. And this is feeding something into the subconscious of those who watch, overwhelmingly kids. The programming starts subconsciously from the earliest age. Oh, the, the Olympics in 2012, the one-eyed man, the eye. Here you had the Monsters, Inc. The, the, the central character had a single eye, and the monsters were feeding off the energy of children. It was their sustenance. And then you have this. This is un unbelievable again. The number of personalities who get photographed covering one freaking eye up in some form. I mean, look at it. And there's hundreds more. Most of them won't know. Another sim great symbol of this archontic network in all its forms is the, the flame or the lighted torch. And what the, uh, the Gnostics said was that the archons are made from luminous fire, the jinn were made from smokeless fire according to the Islamic uh, belief and the archon phoenix. That all comes from this uh, archontic symbolism, the phoenix rising from the ashes in fire. And according to Freemasonic historians, the phoenix morphed in terms of symbolism into the more acceptable eagle, and that's why you have eagles on so many flags and, 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 and state logos. So all this is putting information into the subconscious mind to filter through to the conscious mind. So, in plain sight, Saturn. Um, Saturn is, um, I would say, after my research over the years, is fundamental to understanding how this, quote, bad copy became our fake reality and continues to be so. First of all, Saturn was widely, widely, widely worshipped in the ancient world. Question, why would it be when we can hardly frickin' see it? Never mind what they, they, the ancients could do. Well, there's a story about why. Um, this, as we see it today, wasn't always like it was, and in geologically, <coughs> very recent times, it wasn't like this. Um, people like Emmanuel Velikovsky and others have studied over the years and written books, and they've been followed up by people like uh, um, the uh, Electric Universe uh, researchers like David Tolbert and uh, uh, Thornhill in, in books more recently, as they have looked at the evidence that there was a catastrophic um, upheaval in the solar system in the relatively recent past, not yesterday afternoon, but the relatively recent past, which could well sync with when this bad copy fake reality was locked in. All over the world you have um, global destruction myths and catastrophe myths manifesting under names like Atlantis and Lemuria and Mu, um, but they are unbelievable in their um, common themes are how they describe what happens. And after this 
movement of planets, which was a massive disruption of the electromagnetic order, as I mentioned earlier, which meant the stability had gone, they ended up where we see them today. Now, this is a fantastic book. Uh, I almost can't get it now, and if you can, it costs a fortune. But it's, it was an, uh, uh, represents a magnificent piece of research by this man, David Tolbert, one of the people involved in the Electric Universe um, information. It's called the Saturn myth. And what he did was study the worship of Saturn all over the world, studied its symbolism, studied what they said about it, studied why they said they worship Saturn. And what came out was this, that Saturn once upon a time was anywhere but where it is now, and at the time it had no rings. Come to that as we go along. Actually, it was the dominant planet, I would say star, sun, in the Earth sky, and the way they describe it, it went around in an orbit um, in sync with Mars and Venus as it moved around. And that was the dominant light, the dominant sun, if you like, from Earth in the Golden Age. Uh, and I say that um, Saturn is a, a dwarf star, which is not a great amazing thing because there's so many dwarf stars out there they say now it's unbelievable um, and what they said in the early astronomical traditions is that Saturn was the primeval sun that's how they described it and Plato referred to Saturn as Helios the sun god not our sun that we see today the Saturn sun referred to as Helios now we take Helios to mean our sun because it's the sun god. I say that's a mistake. Actually, they were talking about Saturn. And Diodorus of Sicily, an ancient historian, reported that the Chaldeans, in the same area as Sumer, Babylon, now Iraq, called Saturn by the name Helios and said that this was because Saturn was, quote, the most conspicuous of the planets, which fits exactly with Talbot's research across the, and I tell you, it's across the global uh, cultures. The creator of modern Christianity worshipped Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. Sol, it turns out, was another name that was used for Saturn uh, uh, and not the sun we think we see today. So when you start to let the, it kind of filter through, that at least most of the ancient sun gods were referring to the Saturn sun, not the sun we see today. That would make Heliopolis, famous city of the sun in ancient Egypt, as the city of Saturn, uh, with the obelisks, the pillars, outside the temple in Heliopolis. And that relates so closely to Solomon's temple, the mythical Solomon's temple. Every syllable of Solomon means the sun. Question now is which sun? And again, you've got the two pillars outside, just as with the one in Heliopolis. Then you come to Freemasonry, and its temples have the twin pillars worshipping the sun, the Saturn sun. Come to that as we go along. So when you go in this symbol, absolutely obsessed network, you come to the twin towers, the twin pillars, a coincidence? No chance. And what are the chances of this if that is the Saturn sun, Helios, Heliopolis? This um, obelisk in St. Peter's Square is an original obelisk put there from Heliopolis, I would say the city of the Saturn sun. And I've been saying for years and years and years and years that the Roman church is worshipping Saturn. The Bennu bird of Heliopolis was symbolized as Atum Ra, both symbolized Saturn. And the Bennu bird became the phoenix, which became the eagle, as Freemasonic historians talk about. They worship Saturn as the old sun, the dark sun, the dark lord, and the lord of the rings. Later, Satanism is Saturnism. And it's also 
symbolized as a eye. Now, what Tolbert uh, concluded from reading all these accounts of what happened to Saturn was this, that during these catastrophes, there was, this is a quote from his book, the subject of the global creation legend, the global catastrophe legend, is a spectacular cosmic event actually witnessed by the ancients. Massive quantities of cosmic debris exploded from Saturn, clouding the heavens and eventually congealing into a vast band around the planet. Now, the band is described, like he said, as around the planet. However, what is described is the reflection onto that band of the sun we have today um, were, made it seem from Earth as if there was only part of it, like a, like a beard. And as the, uh, the day moved on and the sun's uh, angle moved, it's described as appearing that this band went around uh, Saturn, as I'll explain. Now, this is one of Saturn's moons, and I only put this up here because it shows this light behind it. Now, the source of this light is not the same as I'm talking about, but it just gives a feel uh, today, looking at that angle of that Saturn moon, of what it must have looked like in the way they described from Earth, this band, this luminous band. And what they said is, as the sun moved around its angle in relation to Saturn, it appeared from Earth that this was moving around, moving around the... Um, around Saturn, but that became the main symbol because that appears to be what it looked like for most of the Earth Day at that time. And so you see um, symbols relating to that um, all over the ancient world, which um, Talbot came up with. Um, let's just go further forward here, I'll come to something else. There's loads of them with the, the band and the disc Saturn. Loads of them like this, with, uh, symbolizes the horns with the, the, the planet, the sun in the middle of it. And Lord of the Rings was a name given to Saturn. And here you see in the, in the movie, you see the same symbol and the eye of Sauron, the reptilian eye as the source of power. They're using it now in Apple products as well. Um, here you have um, the man who started a satanic... Uh, secret society in Germany called the Brotherhood of Saturn. And these are Saturn symbols, and there you see the round circle with the dot in the middle and the horns. Now, that round circle with the dot in the middle is said today still to have been an ancient symbol of the sun. Well, there's nothing when you look at our sun to, to use a symbol like that to symbolize it. But you look at that symbol in relation to what Talbot's saying, and it's very obvious what it was symbolizing. You had a, an unbelievably Saturn-esque stage show done at the Super Bowl in 2012 by Madonna with the, the luminous, fiery eye again. And there is Saturn with the, um, the crescent between the Twin Towers in the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Great Queen Street in London. You look at the symbol of, of Islam and it can be interpreted as the star and the crescent that was used in the ancient world. These laurel leaves uh, symbols are very much in uh, uh, sympathy with that. This, of course, is the United Nations with the world as a target, very appropriate. And that is the symbol of the Windsors, the royal family, the Windsors royal family. That's, of course, an American great, uh, great, um, uh, what do you call it? There's uh, the flying disc, uh, again, a satin symbol. Uh, you see that on many cars and in many areas of the corporate world. And of course, in that Saturn-esque presentation, you had exactly that used in the Madonna uh, stage show. Now this uh, is um, why Satanists worship the goat. Uh, in one form, the goat god Pan. This is Manly P. Hall, Secret Teachings of All Ages, um, who is... Um, one of the major uh, Freemasonic historians over the years. He said, Pan was a composite creature, the upper part 
with the exception of his horns being human and the lower part in the form of a goat, the god himself is a symbol of Saturn because this planet is enthroned in Capricorn whose emblem is a goat and that is where that comes from, Bapomet, one of the most famous of satanic worshipping symbols. And you see them uh, on this ring, is Bapomet on Beyonce. She's dressed Lady Gaga as Bapomet. And there is um, Baroness Philippine de Rothschild with Bapomet massively round her neck. I am staggered, I don't believe it. Um, the owl is, is Saturn, the, the, the owl of Bohemian Grove. Apis or Apis, the Egyptian Saturn god, the, 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 uh, the, the bull god, the, 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 the god of... Um, Saturn, and that's where you get the golden calf and all that stuff. And again, you've got the money system symbolized as the bull as well. Now, I said earlier that numbers are just digital expressions of frequency waveform information fields. This is called the magic um, square of Saturn, and it's also the magic square of Freemasonry, of course. And why it's magic is whatever way you go and you add those numbers up, they come to 15, don't matter which way you go. Now in numerology, you add the numbers until you get a single number. So 15 in numerology is 666, 666. And that represents the energy frequency of Saturn, which I'll come to. Now this is the sigil of Saturn and they get it by drawing between the squares of the magic square from one to two, two to three, three to four. And that's how they get that. Now, if you turn that up on its side, you get that, which is what that is. The most obvious um, symbol of Freemasonry, because they're worshiping Saturn, uh, which is an expression of this archontic fake reality. That is the symbol of Balmoral, the Scottish home of the royal family. Exactly the same, the sigil of Saturn. This is an ancient symbol of Saturn, the um, six-pointed star, the star of David. It's not, they just hijacked that. It's, it's a symbol of Saturn going way, way back. And this is where the name Rothschild came from. They had a red version of the six-pointed star on their house in Frankfurt, where the Rothschild uh, dynasty came out of, and in German, red shield is Rothschild. The very name Rothschild comes from a symbol of Saturn. And they then took it and put it on their fiefdom of Israel. Saturn, same with many law enforcement symbols. There it is as an ancient depiction of Saturn, six-pointed star on the moons. Uh, there's um, the six-pointed star on this um, necklace of the mysteries. And here it is again. And all of these are from Asia. It is not a unique Jewish symbol. The Rothschilds took it as a symbol of Saturn and put it as a Jewish symbol. No one is more manipulated by the Rothschilds than the Jewish people of the world. No one. And here you have it in Christianity, the six-pointed star, and oh, they're ex-pope. And there it is between the pillars in the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Great Queen Street in London. It's all Saturn. They're all pissing in the same pot, all of them. <laughs> now, another ancient symbol of Saturn is the black cube, which you see all over the place. And this is interesting. We're going to get in now into how... Um, this matrix actually works. This is a permanent hexagon storm in the North Pole of Saturn. It's two Earths uh, wide, and it's uh, going all the time, and it rotates exactly in sync with Saturn's radio emissions. And in geometry, the hexagon is also the six-pointed star and is also the cube. They are different expressions of the same energetic state. And so when you look at this, this is just a crop circle, but that's uh, um, coincidental. You look at that crop circle and it's a hexagon, a flat hexagon. Look at it again, but see it three-dimensionally, even though it's exactly the same picture, and it becomes a cube. 
They are different expressions of the same energetic state. So a hexagon is also a cube, is also a six-pointed star in, in ge geometry. And therefore, this cube, the Kaaba at Mecca, is a symbol of Saturn, and that's what they're worshipping, though they don't realize it, though the inner circle will. The black cube that Jewish people put on their third eye as part of their ritual is Saturn. And when they worship at uh, Mecca, they even make them sit in concentric bloody circles. They'll have them going round next. And so when they are doing their circling of, of that um, symbol of Saturn, that which is that frequency can feed off it. This is the um, symbol of Saturn in terms of uh, astrology. And this is the symbol of the Soviet Union, which was created by the Rothschilds. The symbol of Saturn, the hammer and the sickle. The sickle will become relevant shortly. Uh, in fact, now. This is the ancient Greek god of Saturn called Kronos, the bearded man, holding the scythe. And Kronos is father time uh, with the scythe and the beard. Chronos, chronology, time. It's where it comes from. It's going somewhere. Saturn is the god of space and time, so it is said. Crown comes from Chronos, the god of Saturn in ancient Greece. The grim reaper is Saturn with the scythe, the death cult, exactly. Then you've got um, El and the Elohim. El is the Jewish god or, or the Hebrew god of Saturn. I would say El and the Elohim in the biblical realm is Demiurge and the Archons. And you have Arch, uh, Archangels, Michael, Gabriel, the El goes all over the place. We have elections where the pawns are elected to serve the elite. We have Israel. And that is the symbol of El, the black cube. It's Saturn. The Black Sun, the Dark Lord, the Demiurge, Saturn, Kronos, Satan, they're all different ways of saying the same thing. Then you have the bearded man. The God, he's always kind of symbolized with a beard. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from Kronos, the bearded man who is the God of Saturn. You see beards in religions all over the flipping place. And the beard comes from this symbolism of Saturn with the luminous crescent. And so we come to probably the most famous bearded man, the Saturn pattern. Well, hello from Rome. This guy comes from um, Rome and the worship of Saturn. This is Fritz Springmeier, a very uh, accomplished uh, researcher into all this. Saturn is an important key to understanding the long heritage this conspiracy has back to antiquity. The city of Rome was originally known as Saturnia or the city of Saturn. The Roman Catholic Church retains much of uh, the Saturn worship, hence Heliopolis uh, obelisk, um, in its ritual. Saturn also relates to Lucifer in various occult dictionaries. Saturn is associated with evil. And uh, Saturnia, Saturnalia, the fifth century Roman writer Theodosius said, that Saturnalia, which was in Rome at the running up to our Christmas, was to mark the time when Saturn suddenly disappeared, which fits with that catastrophe story that Talbot talks about. So Saturnalia, that is the ruins of the uh, temple of Saturn in Rome today, is actually Christmas. They decorated trees, they gave presents to each other, they used holly, same thing. And Santa is an anagram of Satan, Saturnalia, it's Kronos the Saturn god. Now, the bearded man is, is often used for Saturn. This is William Blake, um, who was a very deep thinker and knew a lot of inside information. And he painted this picture in 1794 called Ancient of Days. Ancient of Days is one of the phrases used in the Bible to describe God. And, and he uh, depicts him as the architect. This is um, on the GE building in uh, Rockefeller Plaza in New York, again, the Ancient of Days, which I say is the Demiurge Saturn, the architect. Freemasons call their god the great architect of the universe. The Demiurge was called by the Gnostics the great architect of the universe. And in the Matrix, we had the architect, 
creating the fake reality, the bearded man. And when you look at Saturn, the control system, it fits all the boxes of the society we live in. The religions, secret societies and Satanism are worshipping Saturn. Astrologically, in other words, energetically, banking is astrologically ruled by Saturn. Politics and the institutions of state of all levels astrologically ruled by Saturn. Corporations astrologically ruled by Saturn. Law in the court system astrologically ruled by Saturn. Science astrologically ruled by Saturn. And it's amazing that the, the, uh, the left side of the brain and the traits of it and the, the Saturnian uh, traits and the reptilian brain traits are remarkably the same. So all these different parts of the human institutions of society are Saturn's little helpers. The vast majority not knowing, the inner circle absolutely knowing. All this court symbolism and religious symbolism and the, the headgear in education, it's all Saturn. And you see it endlessly in corporate logos. Now Jordan Maxwell has been talking about Saturn symbolism being all over society. for decades and decades and decades and decades. My question is, why? Why is Saturn symbolism everywhere? Why is it worshipped by all these people? There has to be a reason. Well, I think this is the reason after what I put together. The Saturn moon matrix. The Gnostic set of the archons, they make something appear to happen that does not actually happen. They can induce virtual reality experience. And they say of the jinn in Islamic belief, manipulate humans by creating illusions. I went into this uh, subway station in New York a few years ago and saw this painted on the floor and I thought, that's extraordinary. You had the eye and the ring, Saturn, and over the world was this broadcast system, basically. And it started a train of perception and research. And again, we go back, you know, do we live in a simulation? What is the archon illusion that's given us this fake reality compared with the one that was before? What is making us decode a different reality now to the one we did before? And it seems to me that Saturn is fundamentally part of this fake matrix that we call the world and that part of what it does is act as a firewall from the original reality so we don't decode it, just like they do in China to stop people getting great tracks of the internet. Interestingly, the Gnostics say the outermost planetary sphere or archon of the matrix, uh, I say, was Saturn. Beyond that was Leviathan, a snake swallowing its own tail called the Ouroboros. Souls had to pass through this to reach paradise. There was another esoteric um, concept called the ring pass not, and this is a, a, um, a point where while you remain in the illusion of duality, you can't progress beyond it, called the Ouroboros, the snake swallowing its tail. And there on that Saturn symbol, you see the Ouroboros in the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry, exactly what the Gnostics described. And within that reality is what we call time, the great controlling mechanism, Kronos and Saturn, the god of time and space. Now, coming from Saturn is a particular frequency, and it's the frequency that's making that, um, that storm at the North Pole. And this is Saturn, which is um, recorded by NASA. Nice man. And what the Saturn rings are, are they're made of sound. I had this sent to me uh, by a sound engineer. This is a ring of Saturn from a particular angle. And he said, I see that every day, that is sound. And there's a thing called cymatics, which is creating patterns purely by sound, where they put um, kind of particles on a, uh, Electric, uh, a metal plate, and then they play sound across, and the sound, which is an information source, makes the uh, patterns move into a certain sequence. And as the sound changes, 
the pattern, the sequence, the symbol changes. And it seems the higher the frequency, the more complex the patterns. So sound is a vehicle for delivering information that creates form. And this is a cymatic symbol, the six-pointed star, created purely by a particular sound. And that's what that is, and that's why it rotates exactly with the radio frequencies of Saturn. This is a standing sound wave, and it's an eye storm at the south pole of Saturn, which is permanently going round, and will do so while the sound coming from Saturn is that sound and that frequency. There's a standing wave, looks like an eye, done in a studio. This is the, the standing wave of rings done in a studio, just like Saturn. It's all sound. Now, these symbols here, I got off the internet, and what it is, they're playing through really fast. You can't see what the symbols are, but when you freeze frame them, uh, what they are, they're reacting to sound. And when you freeze frame them, suddenly you see the symbols that are appearing very fast, but you can't see with the naked eye. There's a six-pointed star in one of them. There's a hexagon. And so a symbol is an expression of a sound, and a sound is an expression of a symbol. So all these symbols and this magic square numerologically of uh, the magic square of Saturn are all representations of the frequency of Saturn and when they interact with our subconscious they're locking us into the frequency of Saturn from all over the place. A sound wave creates a symbol and a symbol generates a sound wave although we won't be able to hear it in our range. So when you see these artistic patterns in churches and stuff we see them as patterns, but they're actually a representation of sound frequency. So on an inaudible level, they're giving it off. And Saturn is, therefore, I suggest, a major part of the broadcasting of this fake reality, which we are decoding into a world we think is real, but is actually fake. And maybe that was the pineal gland once. And maybe now that's Saturn, which has hijacked the pineal gland. So Saturn was ringless, according to the ancients, before this great catastrophe. So where did the bloody rings come from? Um, this man, Norman Bergram, has a long, long history, he's in his 90s now, um, of working in high-tech space and missiles and NASA and all the rest of it. And he wrote a book some years ago called The Ringmakers of Saturn, because when he studied pictures of the rings, he realized they were changing, and not only changing, they were being made as you looked at the pictures. This Voyager spacecraft went closest to Saturn in 1980, and then there's the Cassini craft, which arrived in 2004, and I think he's still in the area. And when he compared uh, pictures from both of them and then compared pictures in relation to the other, he realized that the story of Saturn was very different to the one he thought and he'd been told. He said this in his book, several years ago a number of folks in the astronomy and physics world began to th uh, theorizing that these rings had to be much younger than the universe, perhaps only about 100 million years old, but one pair of pictures shows a change in five minutes. An impression is conveyed that the latest reported measurements purport to be the true ones, when in reality all might be quite nearly correct at the time of observation, but general reluctance to accept variable ring system geometry occurs because of the apparent failure to identify a physical mechanism suitable for producing recurrent change. In other words, because they can't explain why it's changing, they'll just deny it's bloody changing. And on the pictures, and NASA has these pictures, he saw these, what he calls electromagnetic vehicles. And these are um, thousands of miles long, some of them. And anyone thinks that's fantastic, that's the Earth in relation to Saturn. We're not talking about the same relationship to size. And there's loads of them on these pictures. These electromagnetic vehicles, he calls them, all over the place. Here's one pictured uh, next to the rings by the Hubble telescope. Here's a few NASA pictures showing one of them apparently moving you put the pictures together. Why have we never heard of these except through Norman Bergeron? And then he found pictures where these electromagnetic vehicles 
went into the rings and all this stuff was coming out of them that were making the rings as he was looking through the pictures. They're not natural. They say the water ice and stuff is in the rings. I reckon you'll probably find that there's a certain crystal in the rings that is generating the frequency. And this is from a, just a couple of weeks ago. The mysteries of Saturn's expanding F ring. Saturn's most distant ring is twice as bright and three times as wide as it was during the voyage of flybys fly in uh, 1980 and 81. The great mystery of Saturn's rings, how they formed, why are they like that, we don't know. Well, maybe we do. There's this massive ring that was found in 2009, about 3.7 uh, million uh, miles out from Saturn, but around Saturn. Get a billion Earths in it. And I'm suggesting that actually that broadcast comes across to us. The Saturn matrix is a band of frequency which we are tuned to and we think it's real. It's a virtual reality as, as uh, described by the Gnostics. Now, uh, uh, <coughs> I'm going to move on quickly because uh, we want to run out of time, but the moon, as I've said before, is fundamentally involved in this. I read this book, Who Built the Moon? The, the um, evidence for the fact the moon is not a natural body is fantastic. Um, and interestingly, what the book found was the, the relationship in terms of mathematics and all the rest of it, of the Earth, the moon, and the sun, is completely different to anything else in the solar system. And what the Gnostics said was the Archons created the rest of the solar system but did not create this. The maths involved in the Earth, Moon, Sun system is nothing less than staggering. They've been put together with the accuracy of the proverbial Swiss watchmaker, the book said. That's why the, the uh, Moon is about the same size as the Sun, almost exactly at the time of an eclipse. And uh, the, sun, the Moon is perfectly placed, said this BBC documentary, sustain life, but that's pure luck, a cosmic coincidence. I don't think it is. We never see the other side of the Moon. We only see one side of it. And they say in the book, the moon is bigger than it should be, apparently older than it should be, and much lighter than in mass than it should be. It occupies an unlikely orbit and is so extraordinary that all existing explanations for its presence are fraught with difficulties and none of them could be considered remotely watertight. They've got no idea. They first of all had the whack theory, something like a Mars-type planet whacked into the Earth and bits became the moon. That didn't work out. They had the double whack theory where it came back and had another go, and so they go on. And uh, these scientists saying here, the best explanation for the moon is observational error. The moon doesn't exist because it shouldn't if it's natural. It seems easier to explain the non-existence of the moon than its existence. And they've smacked the moon a number of times with massive explosions and uh, uh, impacts. And what's come from that is the evidence says the moon is actually hollow. This is a NASA scientist, again, Gordon MacDonald. Um, it would seem that the moon is more like a hollow than a homogeneous sphere. This man from MIT said the lunar orbiter experiments had vastly improved knowledge of the moon's gravitational field and indicated a frightening possibility that the moon might be hollow. The moon is inside out, said this scientist. And as Carl Sagan said, a natural satellite cannot be a hollow object. These uh, scientists from the Soviet Academy of Sciences, I talked about this at length in my books, um, wrote a, a major article in 1970 uh, suggesting very strongly with considerable evidence that the moon was actually a construct. And people like Ken Johnson who've worked uh, for NASA and on photographs from the moon, he's come out and said actually there are non-natural um, phenomena all over the moon, including bases, things you can't explain that are not natural and there are uh, towers which have been smudged out, some of them not very badly. What the heck is that on the moon? Um, here's a, um, a close-up of it. I mean, what's that? That's not natural. So where did it come from? Who put it there? This is called Blue Gem, or um, the um, uh, blue circle, which um, it kind of shines electric blue. It was seen as a light from the 1700s by astronomers. Now we can see what it is, 29 miles in diameter. What the bloody hell is it? No one can say. And in so many ways, the moon appears to be something akin to the Death Star moon in the Star Wars um, films. And indeed, two moons of Saturn look 
remarkably like the Death Star Moon. And it, as I've put it together over the years, is like an amplifier of the Saturn broadcasts, which are then fired at the Earth in far greater, with far greater power and thus influence on our reality. And if you put that there, it kind of gives an indication of what I'm saying. Now, talked about that Charney project, and what came out from it. Long after I've been talking like this about the moon and its influence on our reality, this article came out and in part of what was said in it, he talked about the moon. They said this entity that they connected through a computer system with said, the moon is not a natural heavenly body. Life was better for humans before the moon came. Moon forces control time and manipulate the mood of humans. The moon is there to control the Earth's mood, emotion, and a big calm would come over the Earth without the moon. There would be only little storms, not big storms. The old race, Archons, captured the moon from space and located it next to the Earth. That is um, said to have happened by many, many ancient cultures. People and animals without the moon would become calm and peaceful, and anxiety and fear would dramatically decline. The oceans would be much calmer, heavy thunderstorms and lightning would be rare, and the climate would be balanced with no extreme heat or cold. Telepathic interdimensional communication would become widespread, and people would be able to see new colors, higher frequencies, in an enhanced color spectrum. And that fits with the fact that this frequency, this matrix, is suppressing human expansion of awareness, keeping us in the box. There would be major changes. This really left field, this one. There would be major changes to the human respiratory system as blood and breathing chemistry changed. Those born after the moon's demise would be able to hold their breath underwater for hours at a time. The Saturn moon matrix. That's the reality we think is the world, the one that is locking us in to this round and round and round free society, go to work, work, buy, consume, die. Work, buy, consume, die. That's the matrix that's playing us. <laughs> control the energy scene, you control human perception. We are in a band of frequency. A friend of frequency is the matrix, a band of frequency of information. We are blinded by the light. We look at light and we think light is like luminous. But that's just the decoded expression of an energetic frequency field that we call light. And when they talk about God saying, let there be light in the Old Testament, I would suggest that's far more likely this demiurge, fake God in this Genesis description, building the matrix. Let there be light. The speed of light in the walls of the matrix. Beyond that is beyond its walls of suppression. So people are within the matrix thinking it's the world going round and round and round, being played like a violin while they think they're playing the instrument. And like a prisoner in a pitch black cell, we may never be able to see the walls of our prison. And that is the wall, I would suggest. And that's why anyone gets close to saying we can go faster than the speed of light. The scientific establishment comes down on them like a pile of bricks. Real? Is it real? Is the night sky real or is it a planetarium? I've been thinking that since I was a kid. Well, for a start, it only exists in that form in our heads. So quite easily it can be just a construct rather than what we call natural. The archontic architects of our fake reality. And so this scene from the Matrix movie is absolutely perfect if you add two words. The Saturn moon matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. 
You can see it when you look out your window or you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, a prison for your mind. Human world, no, it's the Archon world, and they're trying to make it more and more the Archon world, which is why the world is changing in its image. And I came across these books of Carlos Castaneda long after I was into all this stuff, and I, I fell off my bloody chair nearly when I read some of it. They're based on the, the uh, words of a Central American shaman called Don Juan Matus. And this is what he said. Um, we have a predator that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we do not do so. Indeed, we are its prisoner. They took over us because we are food to them, yes. Low vibrational emotional energy. And they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in coops, the predators rear us in human coops, human eros. Therefore, their food is always available to them, especially if there's lots of wars. Think for a moment and tell me how you would explain the contradictions between the intelligence of man, the engineer, and the stupidity of his systems of belief, or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of beliefs, yes, our ideas of good and evil, yes. Our social mores, they are the ones who have set up our dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetedness, greed and cowardice. It is the predator who makes us complacent, routinary and egomaniacal. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators have engaged themselves in a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist. A horrendous maneuver from the point of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. They gave us their mind because they gave us their frequency and we are decoding their frequency and thus becoming part of their hive mind. The hive mind, the archons, the reptilians the, and, and the Borg in Star Trek, classic uh, representation of the archons. All of these different um, groups are said to operate with a hive mind, a hive mentality. And we've been collected to it. The Borgs, they, they were like transhumanist type figures, exactly really in the cyborg way that the Archons are described. And the Borg used to fly around in black, dark cubes. Why do humans blindly follow rules? Because they fight, blindly follow the matrix. Don Matter said, I know that even now, even though you have never suffered hunger, you have food anxiety which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that any moment now its maneuver is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Though through the mind, which is after all their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them and they ensure in this manner a degree of security to act as a buffer against their fear. Sorcerers of ancient Mexico reasoned that man must have been a complete being at one point, with stupendous insights, avatar society, feats of awareness that are mythological legends nowadays. And then everything seems to disappear and we have now a sedated man. What I'm saying is that we have against us is not a simple predator. It is very smart and organized. It follows a methodical system to render us useless. Man, the magical being that he's destined to be, He's no longer magical. He is an average piece of meat. There are no more dreams for man than the dreams of an animal who is being raised to be a piece of meat. Trite, conventional, imbecilic. And what they've done because of our superior creative potential and expansion of consciousness potential, they have, although they are inferior to that in terms of potential because they are a distortion, they have reduced our, or that of m the vast majority of humanity, to a lower level of awareness than they have. And thus, this 
fits the situation perfectly. In the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. We are the blind. The archons are the one-eyed king. But when we become the two-eyed, third-eyed, true consciousness that we are, game fricking over. Psychopaths have hijacked the world, and it's time to take it back. I have no power is what the Matrix keeps telling us, and what the agents of the Matrix keep telling us. You have to look to authority. We have the power. Awakened, we have the power. And humanity is awakening. And like I said right at the start, understanding the problem is to understand the solution. And we're starting to understand the problem.